Thank you so much. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Beer Pie land to pay my respect to Beer Pie elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people here today. Thank you all so much for coming, for giving your time and your energy and your courage. Thank you to the subcommittee of the CCA Hastings for organizing a fabulous event. And Thank you to Mayor Bessling and to Councillor Intamin for joining us here today and saying a few words. Um, and thank you to our council for their support in this area and the progress that's been already made. This event is part of a worldwide network of events this weekend. Already tens of thousands of people have already come out to support the people's climate mobilization. And this is only the beginning. Most of the weekend and most of the world still lie ahead. We're here to send Australian and world leaders a message. Strong action to prevent severe climate change is top priority. Yes. This weekend, this message is naturally sent in a northwesterly direction toward Paris, where the United Nations Climate Summit begins on Monday with the aim of limiting warming to two degrees. But this is not only about Paris. While it is a very important meeting, it's far from the end of the game. High temperature records, severe storms and floods, heat-related illnesses, droughts and bushfires. Yes, Australia saw all of these in the past, and global warming or climate change doesn't cause them, but they're more frequent, and when they occur, they're more severe because of climate change. Yeah. Carbon dioxide pollution, while not the only factor from human activity, is clearly the largest, and it's probably the most solvable part of this problem. And polls show that the majority of Australians want more action to reduce carbon emissions. So then, what are the barriers to bold decarbonization that we and the rest of the world need and want? Is it technology? Last week I asked this question of a renewable energy engineer at the University of New South Wales. And he said, quote, nope. <laughs> Especially with the leaps now being made in storage, the renewable energy technology is ready to start scaling up. And the sooner we get started in a serious way, the sooner we'll get there. The engineers are ready for us when we're ready for them. Is it perfectly mature? Are there no tweaks yet to be made? Possibly not, but we didn't wait for a high definition flat screen before bringing televisions into almost every home. He also told me that renewable energy isn't technology isn't as new as I thought. It turns out that Leonardo da Vinci played around with solar thermal designs in his spare time. And the first electricity was made from solar and wind both in 1887. Is it the cost? Well, yes and no, it depends who you are. The transition to a decarbonized economy will certainly financially harm holders of fossil fuel reserves. But for the rest of us, it's not nearly as bad. I would argue that even at some cost, it's an investment we need to make now because the costs of climate change will dwarf this. And the longer we postpone it, the more these costs will rise. But the CSIRO says, we don't have to wreck the economy or give up the things we love to protect the environment if we make the right choices, if we make them soon. And importantly, even though individual actions are very important, collective choices, policy and infrastructure are far more impactful. Yep. Is it humanitarian concern for energy poverty in developing countries? Poor people in developing countries and in Australia are the most at risk from severe consequences of global warming. Here, here. We've been using fossil fuels full on for 150 years and we haven't solved poverty yet. So I think it's time we give something else a try. <laughs> Moreover, <laughs> wouldn't it be a false economy to build new infrastructure that ties new electricity consumers to old technology? seems to me that these consumers would be better served by skipping over old energy technology altogether and going directly to the technology that will have the most longevity. Yeah. And much of so-called energy poverty is due to geographic remoteness from a supply grid, whereas these same areas often have plentiful sun and wind. Renewable energy has other benefits. The decentralizable nature of solar, wind, and other renewables makes them not only a viable alternative, but actually a much more suitable choice in many locations. This also supports self-sufficiency and resilience rather than dependence on a large central supplier. 
A great model of this concept is community-owned renewable energy projects, which are springing up all over the world. And we're lucky here in the Hastings to have our very own the Energy Forever project. You heard Port Macquarie Hastings Sustainability Project member Steve Lockhart earlier giving the details. What I would like to say is that this is something really exciting in our own area. And if you like renewable energy, I'd really encourage you to get involved with Energy Forever and pledge your support. There are pens and pledge support pledge forms circulating. They're being collected by Ann Wilson, who's waving her arms in the back. So if you have a pledge form to put in, she's the lady. So with those barriers to transition neatly dispatched, what's the holdup? It's resistance to change, stuck thinking, legislation and policy, and yes, it is a scary problem. But we can change. People have embraced plenty of big changes. Even in just the last few years, we've adopted so much new technology and so many new ways of doing things. We've even learned to stream movies online instead of renting a video from the shop. We can do this. Yes. I do want to share one thing that's been worrying me, and that's two degrees of warming. Two degrees is getting so much press lately that I'm a little concerned that many people might be starting to get comfortable with the idea. And while two degrees is a lot better than 3.7, 4.5, or even more, I just want to briefly remind everyone that two degrees might end up being the best we can do, but it's not actually just fine. We're already seeing significant impacts at just shy of one degree. When it comes to global warming, less is more. Emission yeah. Emissions reduction must not be a box-ticking exercise. It should be an all-out, genuine, best effort. If we set ambitious goals, try our best, and fall a bit short, we'll still be better off than if we set weak goals and achieve them easily. So we know what needs to be done. We need to ambitiously work towards strong decarbonization. We know it's technologically feasible. We know it makes economic sense here in Australia and overseas. We know we can't do it as individuals, and we need good collective decision making. So we send this message to leaders in Paris next week to think big, but also keep up the very best effort possible after the summit. And we will need to keep sending this message into the future and taking it to the next federal election. Are you in? Yeah. Yay. We're all in. Well done.